You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. If you've enjoyed the wild ride that has brought us here on the gravy train, well, good. If you're not living through it in real time, it can be a funny, unbelievable story. But it doesn't have a happy ending, as you probably know. Once Toronto was getting through being the butt of everyone's jokes, once the international camera crews started to leave and updates about Toronto's crack mayor stopped dominating headlines every day, well, the crack mayor was still there, still trying to do his job, trying to go to rehab, clearly struggling with a serious addiction, as well as dealing with very public, utter humiliation. And you don't have to have any sympathy at all for Rob Ford, the politician. But the person, well, he was still a person, not a mascot or a sitcom character. This is episode seven of The Gravy Train. Rehab. The Ford's pocket of Etobicoke is a really interesting place. It is flush with money for some of the nicest, oldest, most stately type residences you can find. But there are also these weird po- small pockets of some public housing and uh, where there's a bit of a rougher element. The two sort of merge to coexist as one. At the time in the 80s when the Fords were growing up, it was flush with marijuana and hash, especially hash. So you had this culture or this subculture where you had a t- there was a ton of kids with a lot of money and there was not a lot of parental supervision. And as a result, there was a lot of drug dealing and a lot of drug usage. There's something, something really fucked up happened to that neighborhood in the 80s. And it's kind of an underappreciated part of the Ford story. I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Gravy Train. We left Rob Ford at the end of our last episode in rehab, finally. And we left a divided city waiting to see what version of their mayor would emerge from treatment and what that would mean for the election, which was now less than six months away. To understand the Rob Ford that left for rehab and to understand what a huge step that admission that he needed help of any kind was. You have to understand where Rob Ford came from, literally and figuratively. Our families and our environments shape who we become, for better and for worse. They determine how we love, what we value, how we present ourselves to the world, and often how the world sees us in return. When we asked the people we spoke to for this podcast how Rob's early life shaped him into the man he became, almost all of them pointed to his relationship with his father. And Greg MacArthur, who you heard off the top, dug into the Ford family history for the Globe and Mail. So Doug Sr. was a child of the Depression, and he grew up in the east end of Toronto. And he had a real, like, pull-up-your-bootstraps type mentality. So he, in in some respects, his story is really inspirational because he's a guy who came from not very much and through, like, hard work and determination and, and entrepreneurship really pulled his whole family up. Doug Sr. was tough. It's not complicated. He was born into poverty, and he was determined that he would be the last in his family to struggle like that. He secured his family's financial future by building his company, Deco Labels and Tags. And he secured what he saw as the Ford family's place in society by making the leap into provincial politics. Doug Sr. tried to instill those values of hard work, determination, and toughness into his kids. Rob was the youngest of the four kids he had with Diane Ford. Rob had a special admiration for his dad. Here is Rob's former budget chief, Mike Del Grande. 
His brand was focused around his father, whom he not just liked, he worshipped. He worshipped his father. I don't know what kind of father-son relationship they had, but I can tell certainly from he he loved his father like he loved 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 his father and um i guess rob in some ways wanted to follow in his footsteps after all the work he'd done establishing his family's wealth and social standing doug senior didn't understand the trouble that surrounded his family his kids were constantly in trouble even the most polished of his four children doug junior was allegedly not immune to the pull of the drug culture that was infesting Etobicoke in the 80s. You didn't go into James Gardens and knock on Doug's car and say, you know, give me, I want some hash. Years later, in 2013, Greg MacArthur of The Globe would follow up on allegations against Doug Ford Jr. that accused him of selling hashish in high school. This was in the era before cell phones. And so for those looking for drugs, word of mouth got out that if you wanted to buy hash in Etobicoke, you could go to James Gardens or you could go to the Royal York Plaza. Which is just down the street from the Ford's house. I, you might even be able to see their driveway, the Diane Ford's house, Diane Ford's driveway from the plaza. And uh, we interviewed people who said that they had bought drugs there from Doug Brandy. Rob. Randy Ford was Rob's other brother, the second born after their sister Kathy, the oldest of the three boys. Randy was the biggest, in stature and in personality. He often wore cowboy hats, his signature getup with the boots to match. So Randy came up in almost every interview we did just because his reputation was so legendary. Legendary for what? Violence, fighting, consuming a lot, vast quantities of drugs. This story is about Rob Ford and where he came from. Not about Randy or Kathy or Doug. But to understand the tight secretive circle that Rob kept. To understand why even when his career depended on it, he couldn't admit to the outside world that he had a problem. To understand that, we do need to know about his family and his siblings. As the years went on and the 80s became the 90s, the drugs in Etobicoke got harder. They moved from cannabis and hashish to cocaine and worse. And with harder drugs came more violent crime. A young guy named Marco Orlando, who was an associate of Randy Ford and a number of other people in the Etobicoke drug scene. And Marco owed that group a certain amount of money. And whenever they came to collect, he sort of uh, claimed poverty, said that he didn't have it. And that group had their suspicions about whether that was true or not. And they forcibly confined him and took him somewhere and contacted Marco Orlando's parents and told them that they needed to get paid. And Marco Orlando's parents called the police and the police investigated and they arrested a number of individuals. I think there were four. And one of them was Randy Ford. Randy was charged with a number of offenses. The charges were later dropped. But it was far from the only time that Rob's older brother was accused of violence. There were a lot of stories. Some were reported in books that were later written on the Fords. Some of them showed up in court documents. Some of them were in both places. And the same applies to the only sister among the Ford children. Kathy Ford has lived like a pretty troubled life. Kathy is the eldest of the Ford children and has perhaps the darkest history. She is an admitted drug user. And in fact, the second video that appeared of Rob smoking crack was shot in her basement. I mean, I, she certainly like has abused drugs and, and, and she certainly knew a lot of drug dealers. I mean, one of the things that came out in our research was that she had a very close association at one time 
with uh, a, a number of white supremacists, what was then known as the Canadian chapter of the Ku Klux Klan. Back in 1998, Kathy Ford was in a tumultuous relationship with a man who had connections to white supremacist groups. His name was Michael Kickless. One evening, Kathy's ex-husband, a man named Ennio Sturpe, decided to confront Kathy and her boyfriend. He showed up at their house carrying a shotgun. He later told police that he had brought the shotgun as, quote, an equalizer because his opponent was a martial artist. So he, bring, he brings this shotgun with him and uh, ends up killing Michael Kickless, murdering him with the shotgun. And Sturpe fled the scene. There ended up being this big manhunt. And then he since went to jail, and he's been and, and he's been to jail for numerous other offenses during that time. In 2005, while Rob was sitting on city council, Kathy ended up in the news again. And again, the story involved her boyfriend and a gun. This time she was hosting a party at her parents' house when there was an altercation that caused her then-boyfriend, a man named Scott McIntyre, to run upstairs and grab Doug Ford Sr.'s gun. And I don't know exactly what happened next, but the result was that Scott McIntyre accidentally shot Kathy Ford in the face, or close to it. She survived. Kathy's youngest child, Michael, was only 11 years old at the time, and he was in the house at the time of the shooting. Michael is the child of Kathy and Ennio Sturpe. When he was four years old, his father went to prison for the death of Michael Kickless. He would go with his mother to visit Ennio in prison once a month during his 13-year sentence. Michael was raised mostly by his grandparents, and our producers spoke to him outside of the Ford family home in Etobicoke. Growing up with Rob, uh, you know, I, he's always been a big part of my life. Um, you know, my family is a very uh, close family, a very tight-knit family, whether it's Doug, Rob, Randy. Growing up with a father in jail, it's clear that Michael looked up to his uncle, Rob. He even takes after Rob in both his stature and his political views. I mean, if his hair was blonde instead of the brown that it is, he'd be close to a spitting image. And he came into the family's new tradition of politics at a very young age. When he was a counselor, he would always go on uh, AM640 and the John Oakley show, and uh, he would have a segment, and I think it was Thursday mornings at 7 a.m. It would be Rob's... Uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes on the air. Um, you know, one day I wanted to go with him down to the radio show. And I was probably about 10. He said, okay, be ready. 6 a.m. I'm coming down the street. He wasn't, he wasn't waiting outside for more than a minute. I hear the horn and I'm running, trying to get ready. I jump in the car with him. I remember going down to the radio show. He'd get on the radio show and he talked about all the waste of taxpayers' money that was happening at the city and um, then he, uh, I'll never forget, I, I sat there with the headphones on in the studio. I wasn't going to say anything, though, uh, but just listening. That wasn't the only time that Rob would bring Michael with him to work. It happened fairly often. Rob was very focused on uh, on the ground stuff. Like When I say he didn't like City Hall, you know, being down in his office in City Hall, that's where he didn't want to be. He wanted to be out in neighborhoods, in communities. Um, in one, one, of, one of the biggest things he focused on was trial community housing. And I went on with him because uh, we, were, we were very close. He was, he was a, you know, very close to me, being my uncle and whatnot. And he knew I had a passion in politics. Like, I started to grow that passion. It wasn't just Michael. Doug Ford Sr.'s legacy meant that the entire Ford family were deeply involved in politics, especially in their neighborhood. And they worked their community very well. We'd always host community barbecues, uh, well known as Ford Fest. Um, I think we coined that back in, I think, when Rob was running for mayor, around 2009, 2010. But before that, we always did community barbecues um, right, right here. Uh, we, we would do it at our family home. Ford Fest is a Toronto tradition. 
And it lives on today, though it's long outgrown the Ford family home. It is pretty nuts. It began as Rob's opportunity to bring his constituents out in his neighborhood, to speak directly to voters about his plans for the city, and to grow his base of support. It was a barbecue-slash-political-rally-slash-mass-voter outreach event. It was a party, there's beer, there's food, there's speeches, and there are lots and lots of Fords. And it was always held deep in the Ford stronghold of Etobicoke. Even in the worst of times, even during Rob's worst scandals, it was a reprieve for him. He was surrounded by adoring fans. Even that, though, wasn't always easy. Because despite everything you heard about Rob, Cynthia Mulligan, who covered him at City Hall, and dozens of others, saw another side of him. You know, he was actually a very shy man. Everybody says that. Everybody says that. I heard so often that, you know, if there was a party or a gathering, he'd be kind of alone in the kitchen. You know, he wouldn't, he didn't try and be the center of attention, which is shocking considering it seemed like he loved the, the crowds and the frenzy of Ford Nation. But I think he was actually a very shy man. Rob's supporters and Rob's opponents alike remember a man who didn't really like being in the middle of it all. Yes, despite the contradictions of running for the city's highest office. Other councillors would go for lunch for instance, and eat together and talk policy. Rob rarely, if ever, joined them. When he started to struggle with his drinking, some of his colleagues reached out to him, and he didn't want to talk about it. He switched the topic to football, and he ended the conversation. And as his problems became more and more public, Rob talked less and less to everyone. The Ford family, as a whole, did the only thing they knew how to do, when times were tough. They huddled together, and they tuned out the rest of the city. They closed ranks. They admitted nothing to anyone. Even as it got worse and worse, even as it became clear, all the stories were true. The Fords pretended that it wasn't happening, that Rob didn't have a problem. Yeah, he he had he had an issue with, uh, you know, uh, alcohol, right? And and it wasn't really seen in our through the family's eyes until it really started to get seen in the public, right? After Rob went off to rehab, his family said they had been unaware of his addiction problems. It's pretty difficult to believe that's true where his siblings are concerned, but for Michael, it might be. I didn't have those close conversations with him I was I knew I was his nephew I was 16 years old and I was a part of it and and whatnot but you know I think that was more conversations between you know maybe my grandmother and him his you know his his wife Doug we asked Michael what it was like to see the man he looked up to the man he saw as a mentor fall so publicly you know I don't kind of want to dive into the particular Tough things, but I think, you know, I don't even mention the one for the sake because I think everyone saw it, but, you know, when he was in State Queen. Good job, man. It takes me around five months for the bumble man. And, yeah, and, you know, he was doing that. Like, it, it, you know, he obviously you could tell he had a little bit too much to drink. And it was like, okay, that's not good, right? Um, uh, there, there's no way you, you sit back and condone it, right? Um but, you know, it, it's, you know, I think you almost feel, I, I feel for him when I saw that. The wall of denial that Rob usually presented was almost impossible to crack. But at times, during the worst of his addiction issues, when new stories and new videos were being published weekly, he seemed on the verge of asking for help, of finally admitting he needed it, after the Toronto Star released another video of Rob clearly intoxicated, threatening to kill someone, reporters caught up to Rob outside of his office at City Hall. And Rob wavered. Well, you know what? I just wanted to come out and tell you that um, 
I, I saw a video. Um, it, it's extremely embarrassing. Um, the whole world's going to see it. I, I, you know what? I don't have a problem with that, but it is extremely embarrassing. Um, and I, I don't know what to say. I, I'm again, again, and again. I apologize. I, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're in that, when you're in that state, you, when you're in that state, um, I hope, I hope, I hope none of you have ever or will ever be in that state. And that's all I can say. It's, uh, Cynthia Mulligan was in the middle of all those scrums, and she spent enough time at City Hall to get an inside look at how Rob was handling the relentless media coverage. But I do know, after that video was released of him in in State Queen, where he was clearly intoxicated, one of his insiders said to me that when he saw that, he went into his office and put his head down on his desk and sobbed. Did he know that people were laughing at him? Yes, I'm sure he did. He couldn't have not known. I think it was the state queen, for example, that state queen when he went and and was in his office clearly upset. He realized people were laughing. And it would it would have been a humiliating moment for him. Also a betrayal. You know, the the tape in the living room where he was in a living room and somebody videotaped him. That was a small group of people. Imagine the betrayal that he must have felt. If you remember, back in episode three, we talked about how the media used to report, or not report, on the private lives of politicians. And we talked about how quickly the secret life of Rob Ford cleared that bar. The mayor's spiral into substance abuse was obviously the biggest story in the city, probably the biggest story in the country. And of course, there were no shortage of city hall journalists who spent basically every waking moment of their lives covering it. And that's fine. All that is what the media does. That's their bread and butter. If you don't like it, don't try to hide a drug problem while running a city. But what happened to Rob quickly became something different and darker. Over the past year, as local reporters and then national reporters and then columnists and international news outlets and late-night hosts and everyone who needed a headline or, more accurately, needed a punchline headed to downtown Toronto to join in the fun. Rob's addiction and his public humiliation and his very obvious struggles began to be played for laughs, often right to his face. At moments, it was tough. Because you're always, you're in the public eye. But having said that, and I think uh, the media at the time, um, you know, I don't, I don't like attacking the media or, you know, that, that fight against the media. I think the media has a very critical role to play in, in public life and, and holding politicians to account and, and all that good stuff. I, I think that's important. Uh, but I think uh, the media's objective was to, you know, keep selling papers and putting him on the front cover and, and keep doing that stuff, right? Um, you know, so that was tough. And I don't think that helped someone get through these significant challenges. Uh, I know I don't think people made it easy on him. I remember getting calls on my phone. I wasn't even a part of public life. And I would have, uh, I won't say reporters' names. I won't say outlet names. I, 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 I don't want to bring them into it, but calling me, you know, when I was like 16, 17 years old, you know, where's his rehab? And they found out and they camped outside his rehab. So when he was just trying to get better, they didn't care, to be very candid. Michael talks about how the media went further than was reasonable, covering Rob. They didn't just cover Rob, they covered his family, Michael says, and they covered his young children. Like Dougie came out, young Dougie, um, and the media scrummed him. Like, that's not appropriate. He was eight years old. Um, and he was going out to get something from Rob's car. And the media scrummed him. Like, that's not okay. Rob's former budget chief, Mike Del Grande, has had a lot of time to reflect on the public response to Rob's addiction, as well as his own response. People were so vicious 
And again, the double standard that, oh, you know, we have to provide needles for for drug addicts. And even Rob was dead set against that. But we have to provide, we have to, you know. And then when it came to one of their own, if you will, that logic sort of like, there was no sympathy. There was no empathy for the guy. They mocked him because he went in to buy Kentucky Fried Chicken and he was bringing it home to his kids because they wanted KFC. I thought the media, I thought a lot of the detractors uh, were very mean, very mean-spirited, um, inhumane, um, not kind people, not good people. Um, you know, if we're told, for example, oh, let's spend, you know, $10 million for this, let's spend, and then you got a guy amongst you, right? Right amongst you, that you know, all these other people are faceless. And what do you guys do? Drive more stakes into the, into the corpse? It, it shameful, absolutely shameful. You know, I I looked at myself and I thought, you know, I could have done more. I should have done more. I didn't do more because I I couldn't stomach it anymore. Tom Beyer worked for the Ford administration. In fact, he sat at the front desk outside of Rob's office at City Hall. At this point in the scandal, he was Ford's longest standing staff member. He considered Rob a friend, and he was watching his friend flounder while the whole world laughed at him. I'd known him for 10 years at that point, you know, and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it was heartbreaking in a way uh, to, to see a man with such t- potential and, and, and so, so full of great ideas and so loved by the people, you know. He was trying to be the best person he could be, you know, in in a way. And, you know, people make mistakes and people are foyable and people, you know, can be weak at times. But that doesn't mean they're always weak. And that doesn't mean that they're always going to be in need of help. Whatever you think of their politics and their allegiance to Ford, all those people you just heard from have a point. It is absolutely worth looking back at how we covered that time. How the division that Ford's campaign and his time as mayor before the drugs shaped the coverage of his very real addiction and spiral. And how the Ford's reaction to that broke the model even further. Until the press became either the enemy or a tool to be used. And that's it. It is worth thinking about that and thinking about how we cover people struggling with addiction today. Jonathan Goldsby, the writer for The Grid and Alternative Weekly, was in the middle of all this coverage. And years later, he reflects on how even the difference between the substances the mayor was suspected of using played a role in how he was reported. The fact that it was crack... I think caught everyone off guard. Many people in media and politics also snort cocaine. Uh, it's a largely white, middle class, upper middle class thing. And it was really interesting to see the, or to, 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 and to see and to feel and to think about like how our reactions changed based on the fact that not that anyone was really cool about Rob Ford, you know, you know, snorting cocaine in public. That was a very weird thing for a mayor to do and I assume illegal. But yeah, there was also like a weird sort of, you know, I guess hypocrisy among these classes in terms of like going after Rob Ford for snorting cocaine, which once again, super fucking inappropriate, probably illegal, especially in that context. But I mean, not not everyone has necessarily as a moral high ground on that. Whereas when people realized crack cocaine then it felt like it was open season in a new way, which reflects more broadly, I think, the various racialized ways that people can, race race and class uh, lenses through which people view different drugs. And with, you know, powdered cocaine being considered relatively acceptable and crack cocaine being completely, uh, completely unacceptable. When Rob did return from rehab, the media climate that awaited him was not only highly skeptical, for obvious reasons, it was also dealing with the fact that this story was now global, and it was a hit. There was a huge appetite for Rob Ford, and that created a beast that needed to be fed. 
And by now, we are very familiar with the cycle that that creates. But it wasn't quite as commonplace five years ago. And soon after Rob returned to City Hall and picked up what remained of his duties as mayor, he wanted to put what he saw as and what he hoped was the past behind him. And so he read a 17-minute speech for a select few members of the media. It was an emotional moment, and Rob hoped it would mark a turning point. Good afternoon, everyone. For a long, long time, I resisted the idea of getting help. Like a lot of people dealing with substance abuse, I was in complete denial. I learned that my addiction is really a disease. A chronic medical condition that will require treatment for the rest of my life. To my family, and to all those who stood, stood by me during these extremely difficult times, I want to thank you for giving me another chance. To my fellow counselors, and especially to Karen Stintz for my hurtful and degrading remarks, I offer a deep felt apology for my behavior. Joe Mahevic, who had sat right near Rob way back when he was a rookie counselor, was also still at City Hall when Rob returned from rehab. I'm not an expert in addiction and healing, But you don't heal from an addiction by taking an extended week away. Um, Those are those will be life processes that uh, cannot be dealt with quickly, but need to be dealt with. And you got to get down to causes, and you need a therapist, and you need ongoing counseling, and you really have to you have to work at it. It's not like flicking a switch in the Ford family's mind. Rob didn't have an addiction issue that was deep and needed a lot of care. Oh, he drank a little bit too much, and yes, sometimes he smoked some bad stuff. Uh, but he's still a good guy, and he's still our guy, and we love him, and we want him to lead Toronto. They did not see how deep the issues were. After his speech, Rob tried to move on. He said that he had gotten the help that he needed, and that things would be better now and he threw himself into his re-election campaign. He did not give an inch to the calls for him to step down. And those calls came from opponents, for sure, but also from people who wanted him to focus on his health. He didn't listen to anyone who suggested he might be better off not running for re-election. And to his nephew, Michael, and publicly to other members of the Ford family, This persistence was admirable. He loved his job. He believed in it. He, that was his passion. His passion was helping people. And Rob was not ready to give that up. Um, He cared about his job tremendously. Two other people, though, like journalist Greg MacArthur, who by then had dug into the entire dark history of the Ford family. This perseverance to remain in politics, to pretend that everything was fine, was baffling. What I think about all the time when I think about these things is like the hypocrisy. Like part of their brand is that they know best. They know what people want. And and like Rob is always talking about like budgets, for instance. Like, you know, you wouldn't run your household this way like the city runs. Like, so why would you do this? I mean, that analogy is so hilarious. Like for him to invoke the running of a household, like his house is on fire. <laughs> like, um, and 
So I've always found that fascinating. Like why, given that all of the, the, the stuff that they have been through, that they think that they know better and can tell people how to live their lives or, or that they know best what to do with tax dollars to me is, is crazy. We asked Michael, straight up, why would Rob insist on running for re-election? Why didn't he recover in private? He was as stubborn as can be on that. Like He was relentless. Uh, the harder the opposition went at him, the harder he kept going and, and the harder he worked. And then that was him. That's, that's just who he was. Politics, of course, was one of Rob's two passions. And in the middle of the worst time of his life, he clung hard to both of them. After the story about the video of Rob smoking crack went public, he'd been fired from his job coaching football at Don Bosco. Football, though, was still an important part of Rob's life, especially high school football. So he continued to attend the games. He would cheer his boys on from the sidelines. He kept in touch with his players. Don Bosco High School is now closed. But we really wanted to get a sense of who Rob was when he was away from everything else, when he was away from his family, when he was away from City Hall. So our producers gathered a few of Rob's former football players who agreed to talk. Raquel, Travis, and Robert and met them at the old football field. It sits under the path to a landing strip for Toronto's International Airport. First, Raquel told us about the role Rob played in his life. Friend, father figure with many hats. Then he would joke with you like a brother. He would give you that, that fun structure, like he's strict, but not as strict as like your parents would be. So like an uncle, he could give you good advice. Like I remember when I first came over here, I didn't do no kind of conditioning, no running. And then I said, Ford, I want to quit. I can't do this. I didn't sign up to this. After this, I want to play football. And he said, don't quit. Just play the first game. And I remember I played the first game. And then I came back and I was eating a bag of chips because I couldn't eat too. I told him, I said, I can't eat no more. All this conditioning is ruining me. And he just slapped me on my back. He said, you're eating now, huh? And that just stuck with me because, like, he was able to joke with you. But if you got in trouble, like, if you were skipping school and your grades were low, he would take you to the side. What's going on? Is there anything we could do to help you? He would, like, talk with teachers to make sure your, your grades are on par, try to find you tutors. If you couldn't get breakfast or you needed lunch money or food after practice, he would take money out of his pockets and give it to you. So, like, there was nothing for one of his kids that he wouldn't do. The young men who played on Rob's teams often spoke of his generosity. If a student needed a place to stay, they could stay at Rob's if they needed money to play on the team. He would cover it. Once they graduated, once they moved out on their own, Rob would help them get established. Just make sure they were on their feet. Remember the way Rob spoke about his players when he was running for mayor during that debate with George Smitherman? That wasn't a one-time occurrence. That was part of Rob's shtick. Let me tell you what Rob's character is about. It's about integrity. It's about helping kids get off the street. Helping thousands of kids get out of the game. Putting my own money where my mouth is. I don't talk the talk. I walk the walk. I have a Rob Ford football foundation. I'm caring. I help these kids get out of games. At Don Bosco, we look at Don Bosco, we got a rec sale 10 years ago. People wouldn't go up there. Now, I landed the largest development in rec sales history. So this is complicated. Like the example that you just heard, Rob would often use his time coaching football to deflect from accusations of far more troubling things, from scandals, from homophobia, from racism, etc. A lot of the stuff on the infamous video of Rob smoking crack is hard to make out because he's mumbling. But it's also pretty clear that he talks about his football players as minorities, however he intends it. He told Sun News that his players came from gangs or from broken homes. And he insinuated that some of them would be in jail, if not for football. He used them, politically, 
There's not a ton of debate about that. But if you ask them, or at least the ones we talked to, they didn't care about that. They did think he helped them. They did think he cared about them. They said that he was there for them. And that part matters too. 100% he's right. Like the, There would be a lot more of those players probably in jail. Probably they would be on the streets getting into trouble. And like, there's a lot of players here that I know that went to the next level to go play university football. And he helped them out through that. And they got their education. And now they have great jobs. And maybe not 100% it wasn't all Rob Ford because there's an individual there. But the assistance that he provided for them, 100%, he, he allowed them to get that opportunity. There is some hypocrisy in this too. On one hand, Rob was working closely with a football program that he claimed loudly was keeping kids out of the neighborhood gangs. That would be gangs like the Dixon City Bloods, whom Rob was patronizing with his drug habit. So when I said at the beginning of this episode that you have to understand where Rob came from, I meant it literally too. Etobicoke has a long history of drug culture. Rob grew up in that drug culture, he came of age in that culture, and he never really left it. And that culture is what created these contradictions. Rob was not the only adult from Etobicoke with one foot in the legitimate world and the other still in the neighborhood. For him to be hanging out with quote-unquote drug dealers or whatever the case may be, like, we, we all here are, weren't the greatest kids in the world. Like, you know what I mean? We all had to do things to get ourselves ahead or make sure you pay for different things or do whatever. So it's not that he was hanging out. Like, he, like to him, it wasn't hanging out with a drug dealer. It was me hanging out with my friend, this person. Or I knew this guy from this, and I'm hanging out with this person. Like, yes, to the outside world, yeah, okay, we're going to label that person as this or that. But they are people, and he knew them as people. Like, he grew up in this general area as well, so he understands the dangers that surround this area. So he's not, he's not like he's um, ignorant to it. It's just he was hanging out with people he knew. And I can't, I can't blame him for that. I hang out with people I know, and I know they're not the greatest people in the world, but it's just realities of life, right? If this was a normal story, we'd be coming towards the climax right now. Rob's battle for re-election. By now, all of Toronto knew exactly who Rob Ford was. They knew his policies. They knew his politics. They also knew the skeletons in his closet. They knew how nasty he could be. And they knew what his brand meant. So they could choose. Four more years of that or something else. And there are a lot of people who really believe that Rob would have gotten four more years, almost no problem, that Ford Nation was still in his corner, that people loved him not in spite of his addiction issues, but because of them, and that the divide between the downtown and the suburbs was so great that thousands of suburbanites would vote for Rob simply because he was theirs. People we've talked to for this podcast who have ran in or covered dozens of elections are convinced that Rob would have won pretty handily. And if this was a normal story, we would find out. But it's not, and we won't. I think at that moment, he had to acknowledge that he had to fight him a lifetime in front of him. Next time on The Gravy Train, the ending we got. They made this incredibly last minute, like down to the wire, down to the last 30 minutes to switch places. And you can't even write this ending in Hollywood. 30 years from now, I hope I'm doing something better with my time than thinking about Rob Ford. And you think that you have a shot of winning despite all that the Ford family name now stands for? But that's where the media is out of touch. He was the forerunner announcing Trump. Our plan takes steps to derail the gravy train. In the long course of human history, we're going to look back and say, wow, that was a destructive period. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings, 
the host and writer of The Gravy Train. Stephanie Phillips and Annalisa Nielsen produce, edit, and stitch every episode together. Ryan Clark is also a producer, and he mixes and masters this entire podcast. Claire Broussard and Amal Delich provide editorial guidance. Daniela Giantomasso and Rob Purchase handle archival sourcing. Our production assistants are Lucas Ionetta and Matthew Morrow. You can find The Gravy Train, the other podcast I host, The Big Story, and almost a dozen more at FrequencyPodcastNetwork.com or wherever you get podcasts.